Jack Hart Failure Virtual Journal Club, and we're excited to have uh, this uh, presentation of important papers on natriuretic peptides uh, to be followed by a discussion of the Galactic HF uh, study and the discussion around clinical trials in the COVID and post-COVID era. Uh, we'll divide this uh, present part uh, uh, journal club into uh, uh, important sections. We'll first be discussing the natriuretic peptide uh, analysis in the Paragon HF study uh, presented by Drs. Cunningham and Solomon, uh, followed by the uh, important um, uh, document uh, that Dr. Ibrahim and Januzzi led on a consensus position on what natriuretic peptide levels for entry into clinical heart failure trials should look like, what we should be standardizing, what the variation has been up to date in clinical trials. And then we'll, we'll jump into the Galactic HF study by John Tierlink uh, with commentary by Bill Abraham on how to conduct clinical trials in the COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 era. So let's jump into the uh, first paper and presentation uh, by Dr. Cunningham. Uh, Dr. Cunningham, welcome to the uh, Virtual Journal Club. Before we start, we always ask an important question. Uh, where did you go to high school and what was the mascot? Great question. We got a little feedback there. Yeah. Um, uh, I went to a little high school in Boston called uh, Roxbury Latin, and we were the Foxes. Uh, maybe not the most fearsome mascot out there, but uh, that's what we were. Uh, let's hear about your uh, late breaking paper. Great. Thanks very much. Great. So, uh, good evening. Uh, on behalf of the Paragon HF investigators, I'm pleased to share our work on the effects of Secubitril Valsartan on nt -P &P in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Secubitril Valsartan is a combination neprolysin inhibitor and angiotensin receptor blocker, as you know. Neprolysin degrades vasoactive peptides, including AMP, BNP, and CMP. And therefore, neprolysin inhibition by secubitril raises levels of these peptides. NT ProBNP, however, is not a substrate for neprolysin, and changes in NT ProBNP with secubitril valsartan reflect changes in hemodynamics and heart failure severity. Paragon HF compared secubitril valsartan and valsartan in patients with heart failure and LVEF greater than 45%. NT pro BNP minima were 200 picograms per ml for patients with prior heart failure hospitalization and 300 without hospitalization. These were increased threefold for patients with atrial fibrillation. The primary endpoint, total heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death, was 13% lower with secuitro valsartan, which narrowly missed statistical significance. Women and patients with lower EF benefited more. NT pro BNP was measured in all patients at screening. And we used these values for risk prediction. And then it was measured again in 2,500 patients at five subsequent times, before, between, and after the run-in periods, and at 16 and 48 weeks after randomization. These values were used to assess the effect of secubitril valsartan on NT pro BNP. Patients with higher NT pro BNP at baseline were older, less likely female, with similar racial background. The prevalence of diabetes and prior heart failure hospitalization was similar in higher and lower nt pro BNP groups. And the much higher prevalence of atrial fibrillation in higher nt pro BNP groups was due to the entry criteria, which required a higher nt pro BNP in AF. Patients with higher nt pro BNP had higher New York Heart Association functional class and lower BMI, ejection fraction, and EGFR. So this figure shows NT pro BNP as screening on the X axis and the primary endpoint event rate on the Y axis. As you can see, baseline NT pro BNP strongly predicted events after robust multivariable adjustment, with patients in the highest quartile having two and a half times the event rate of those in the lowest. This relationship between NT pro BNP and clinical event rate was different in patients with and without atrial fibrillation. In non-AF patients, log-transformed NT-proBNP was linearly associated with risk, 
Patients with atrial fibrillation with low NT-proBNP were excluded from the trial, and those with high NT-proBNP had high event rates regardless of AF. But comparing two patients with HEPTEP who both have an NT-proBNP of 1,000, a patient with AF was at lower risk for heart failure events than a patient without AF. It's not that AF is protective, but rather AF may drive an increase in NT-proBNP that is independent of heart failure risk. These data suggest that higher minimum NT-proBNP criteria for patients with AF in heart failure clinical trials are appropriate. We observed the opposite with obesity. In non-obese patients, there was a strong relationship between NT-proBNP and clinical events. In obese patients, this relationship was weaker. Obese patients with lower NT-proBNP retained moderate event rates. In obesity, lower NT-proBNP does not mean low risk for heart failure events. Baseline NT-proBNP did not modify the treatment effect of cubitril valsartan for clinical events. This figure shows screening NT-proBNP on the x-axis and the treatment effect of secubitril valsartan compared with valsartan on the y-axis. Patients randomized to secubitril valsartan had modestly lower event rates in the regardless of NT-proBNP. Next, we examined the effect of secubitril valsartan and valsartan on NT-proBNP levels. During the valsartan running period, NT-proBNP decreased by 5%. During the secuitor of run running period, it decreased a further 25%. 16 weeks after randomization, patients assigned to secuitor of Valsartan largely retained this decrease, while those assigned to Valsartan returned to pre secuitor levels. Secuitor of Valsartan decreased NT pro BMP by 19% at 16 weeks and 17% at 48 weeks compared to Valsartan with p-values of less than 0.001 at both time points. Because of the significant subgroup interactions for sex and ejection fractions observed for the main trial, we investigated NT-proBNP reductions in these subgroups. The reduction in NT-proBNP at 16 weeks was similar in men and women and in patients with ejection fractions higher or lower than the median of 57%. Thus, apparent differences in the clinical effect of secubitral valsartan between the sexes or across the LVEF spectrum cannot be explained by this natriuretic peptide. In conclusion, nt proBNP strongly predicted clinical events in HEPTEP patients enrolled in Paragon HF. For a given nt proBNP, patients with atrial fibrillation were at lower risk for the primary endpoint, and obese patients were at higher risk. Secubitril valsartan decreased NT-proBNP by 19% compared to valsartan, consistently in men and women and patients with lower or higher EF. Baseline NT-proBNP did not identify patients who experienced greater reduction in primary endpoint events with secubitril valsartan. I want to thank Mutu Vadaganathan, Brian Claggett, and Scott Solomon for their mentorship on this project, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, Scott, would you like to make some comments as the uh, senior? Uh, thanks, Chris, and, and thanks for the opportunity to um, present this paper in this forum. Uh, John did such a fantastic job that uh, I, I, I really have very little to add, but let me just um, point out something that I think is, is curious, and I'd be very curious what other people think about this. In the paradigm study in heart failure reduced ejection fraction, um, we found that nt BNP also went down by a, a little bit more than it did in Paragon, about 27% in Paradigm compared to roughly the 20% that John uh, just showed us in, in, in Paragon. Uh, but what was really interesting is that in Paradigm, the lowering of nt BNP was a near-perfect surrogate for outcomes. In other words, when we uh, incorporated nt BNP reduction into a model that took into account um, the, the uh, outcomes, we saw that the hazard ratio went to nearly one. So it was virtually a perfect surrogate um, for uh, the, the outcomes. And we didn't see that in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in, in, in Paragon. And I'm not sure we, we know why for sure. 
Um, we think that um, uh, in many cases, the lowering of NT pro BNP should reflect outcomes, and we've published uh, in uh, a review uh, of a number of trials done by Muthuvada Ganathan uh, that there is there can be an almost linear relationship between the reduction in NT-proBNP in outcomes, but it doesn't appear to be the case with every drug and in every condition. Uh, so I think this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, tidbit that John didn't mention that we, we can't really yet explain. Great. Well, let's uh, let's open this up to uh, people who think a lot about natriuretic peptides. I'm going to pick on Mike Felker first, and uh, Mike, uh, give us your comments on this paper and wh what do you think the uh, implications are? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chris, and congratulations to the authors. I think this is really great data. I mean, one of the things that we recognize is that. Our understanding of HEPPATH as a biological condition um, is still um, very imperfect, and so understanding a lot of the issues that were raised, the interaction between atrial fibrillation and obesity and natriuretic peptides and HEPPATH, how it relates to treatment effect and, and just how it relates to outcomes, I think is, is quite important. And some of the data, I think, was you know what you might have expected, that if you have the same natriuretic peptide value, um, and you have a fib, you probably have a lot less heart failure, relatively speaking, and so you, your outcomes are probably um, going to be better. But um, I wonder, uh, I'll ask Scott, I guess, it's always good to ask, answer a question with a question. Um, so if you had seen these data before uh, a Paragon, would you have done anything differently in the trial? Um, well, <laughs> there... There, there are a lot of things that we might have done this differently, if, what we knew now, Mike. Um, but uh, I think one of the questions is clearly, um, if we use natriuretic peptides as a entry criteria for trials, um, how do we adjust that for atrial fibrillation? And as John um, mentioned, in Paragon, we actually required patients to have threefold uh, the natriuretic peptide level if they were in atrial fibrillation than if they weren't. And the reason was exactly what we saw, which was that we didn't want people to get in just because they had atrial fibrillation and not um, actually heart failure. Um, I, I, you know, that's a trend that other trials are, are using similar kinds of multipliers. Uh, I suppose that we might even argue we could have gone higher um, to maybe four times uh, which is uh, bucking the trend a bit, but um, uh, we do worry that even within the range of six, seven hundred, eight hundred of the patients in atrial fibrillation, that that's and they have hep that that might be driving um, the natriuretic peptides and not heart failure per se. Uh, so it's possible that we might have altered that knowing knowing that result. Does that answer your question, Mike? Yeah, that was good. I thought Chris was coming back, but um, might be having technical difficulties. No, I thought no, I, that was a great answer. I'm back here. Uh, the uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Cunningham uh, as as you look back at Dr. Solomon's uh, phase two study in this population, the Paramount trial published in Lancet in 2012. Uh, Tell us the differences in the magnitude of effect between that trial and this trial, and the patterns of, uh, of reduction in uh, uh, NT Pro. And was that um, um, what you saw in 2012? Is that what you um, expected or did not expect to see in this analysis? Yeah, thanks, Dr. So, I mean, I think it, uh, it was 23% in Paramount, and it was 19% in Paragon. So we might ask, is, you know, is it number one that we didn't achieve the same magnitude of nt pro BNP reduction that was seen in Paramount and Paragon? Well, you know, it was a little less, 19 compared to 23. Or is it that the reduction in the clinical events was a little less than might have been expected for um, you know, that reduction? You know, probably a little bit of that, too. At the same time, I think the substantial improvement in natriuretic peptides does, you know, underscore that the drug um, within the body, it's 
it was affecting hemodynamics, it was affecting the natriuretic peptide pathway. All of those things were true, and it's just that we didn't quite see the magnitude of event rate reductions that have been observed, say, in, in paradigm in the reduced ejection fraction population. But um, Chris, I'll add that in Paramount, the entry criteria for natriuretic peptides was actually higher than it was. Okay. In and so I think that that alone might account for the greater uh, reduction that we saw uh, in Paramount compared to Paragon. Well, we're going to get a lot into a lot of the detail of uh, entry criteria and clinical trials with Dr. Ibrahim's and uh, Januzzi's uh, analyses and position paper, but uh, Jim, what what are your comments on this? You think about natriuretic peptides a little bit in your in your sleep? <laughs> a little. <laughs> so uh, you know, a couple of thoughts. First, you know, congrats to to uh, to John and to Scott for a really nice analysis. And you know, I I do think about this a lot. And I I would say that you know when you talk about um, you know heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. You know, HFPEF is like the dark side of the moon when it comes to, you know, our understanding of physiology in some ways. And reduced EF is, in many ways, a dominant phenotype that drives the natriuretic peptide. And therefore, you know, what you see from a behavior perspective in terms of the link between NT pro BNP and outcomes in REF, it's much more predictable. With preserved EF heart failure, I mean, I, I know there's been a lot that's been spoken about this, but preserved EF heart failure is driven by a number of different phenotypes. So rather than the single reduced EF, um, you know, neurohormonal activation picture that's seen in reduced EF heart failure, which to some extent determines why we've been reasonably successful in targeting therapies in reduced EF, preserved EF is a very different animal. And, and so just like there are different clinical phenotypes, there are different biomarker phenotypes. And so, you know, I don't think you're going to be able to homogenize things as much with an NT pro BNP value with preserved EF as we have been with reduced. This naturally gets to the question of are there other biomarkers that might be useful in preserved EF? We've been looking at NT pro BNP for 20 years. It's time to think beyond natriuretic peptides. There are many other markers that might be useful in preserved EF heart failure. In the same issue, um, Dr. Ibrahim had a paper looking at insulin-like growth factor binding protein 7, IGFBP7, which we and others, together with the Paramount investigators and other studies, have shown to be strongly associated with diastolic function, whatever that is, you know, of E over E prime, left atrial volume. So, you know, thinking sort of, you know, creatively, it may be that other markers may add something unique to the picture with preserved EF um, uh, relative to the potential for response to therapy. All right, our associate editors are not shy. Uh, um, Tarek, you had a question? Yeah, Jim, I wanted to ask you, I mean, uh, like you mentioned, both the curves for uh, uh, Paradigm and Paragon in, in terms of the anti-pro BNP lowering uh, seem very similar. Do you think that there is anything to be said about the fact that the mechanism of Entresto uh, lowers anti-pro BNP and whether that played a role in this somewhat disconnect between the lowering and anti-pro BNP and the clinical benefit? I'd be more interested in asking Scott if, if you know, maybe there's been some, you know, analyses looking at how the, the study participants differed, you know? Um, you know, you can just see that example of adding AFib to the mix makes the same NT pro BNP value tell you something very different. Yeah. So, you know, is there some way that you can sort out differences between Paramount and Paragon, Scott, that might help you to understand, you know, on the individual level? Paramount was so much smaller, it might be hard to do that. Yeah, but I, I think, Turk, you were, you were specifically asking the disconnect between Paradigm and Paragon, correct? Uh, where, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the issue of whether it is directly the mechanism of action. Well, no, because remember, NT pro BNP is not a substrate for nebrolysin. So, uh, the way that this drug works, at least what we think, and we still don't really know exactly how Zucubitril valsartan works, 
it does raise ANP, BNP, CNP, um, and, and Jim has some really nice data looking at beyond just BNP, which is the only thing we actually had in paradigm. Uh, but the fact is that uh, it also raises a lot of other vasoactive peptides, and it doesn't have any direct effect on NT pro BNP. The, the effect on NT pro BNP is due to the improvement in hemodynamics and the reduction in the production of natriuretic peptides. In fact, although BNP goes up to start, uh, we've actually shown that over time it will go down if you treat somebody with scupitril valsartan. Uh, and, and so I don't think that is, uh, is the explanation for, for the disconnect. Um, I mean, as you, the disconnect is not also one that stops and starts at a particular ejection fraction either, as we've seen uh, with the Paragon data. Uh, there is, uh, at least we believe there's benefit in the patients in the lower end of the ejection fraction spectrum. It declines, that benefit declines as ejection fraction goes up. When you get to EFs that are high and people still have elevated BMPs or NT pro BMPs, you do wonder what is that phenotype? Right. Jim, if, if as some people think, maybe uh, those patients with high EF um, uh, and preserved ejection fraction, heart failure, if, if they were to uh, have, say, amyloidosis, for example, you would expect their NT pro BNP to be high. Very much so, yeah. So in amyloidosis, in, in infiltrative cardiomyopathies of all sorts, amyloid is the paradigm, no pun intended. Um, uh, the, the direct toxic effects of the amyloid protein cause um, higher than expected for filling pressures or wall stress um, NT pro BNP values. So, but, but you wouldn't necessarily expect those patients to benefit from this drug, and, and that... You wouldn't expect them to benefit at all, actually. Yeah. That if, if we were contaminated by some patients, yes. I don't think it's a lot, but if it were, maybe that would... Uh, it could have been enough for the difference in the, uh, the, the small number of events you needed to, to move over, over the nominal P-value, which we can talk... Uh, let's hold that, those thoughts and and jump into the next presentation because a lot of this is tying together. So we're very fortunate to have Nazarene Ibrahim and, and uh, Jim Januzzi present their uh, uh, position consensus paper on natural peptide uh, entry criteria in heart failure clinical trials. Nazarene? All right. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. I just want to make sure you can hear me well. Yes. I'm going to provide a brief overview of our position paper, Natriuretic Peptides as Inclusion Criteria in Clinical Trials. Some of the authors are on the panel tonight. Several disclosures, and you can see the details of those in the manuscript. But BNP and NT pro BNP are commonly used as inclusion criteria in clinical trials. However, their use varies widely. So we wanted to understand the current use trends and develop recommendations for future trials on use of natriuretic peptides for inclusion. We performed a comprehensive search via the aggregate analysis of clinicaltrials.gov. And this is a cloud-based database that is um, maintained daily. It includes protocol and result-related data elements for trials that are registered in clinicaltrials.gov starting from February 2000. We began discussions in December 2018 and continued and had several discussions after that. Finally, we made um, recommendations and a manuscript was drafted. We found over 300,000 clinical trials via this database, and out of these, 365 were heart failure trials that used BNP or NT pro BNP or both as inclusion criteria, and this was acute heart failure. Um, chronic heart failure in both HEFREF and HEFPAF trials. We found that NT pro BNP and BNP concentrations required for enrollment varied widely, and there were several trials that required BNP and NT pro BNP, quote unquote, to be elevated without specifying what concentration were required for enrollment. Only 10% of acute heart failure trials and 20% of chronic heart failure trials adjusted for risk factors and comorbidities known 
to affect natritic peptides concentrations, as Dr. Cunningham mentioned before me, including age, uh, BMI, and atrial fibrillation, and even less chronic heart failure trials adjusted for whether they were recruiting HEF for HEFPEF or HEFREF trials. So enhancing diagnostic accuracy is important. We want to make sure we enroll patients with the correct diagnosis. And this becomes really important in HEFPEF. These patients have several comorbidities and things like dyspnea and lower extremity edema can be caused by a number um, of other comorbidities. We alluded to risk enrichment as well. Higher BNP and NT pro BNP concentrations are associated with higher cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular events. But the question becomes, how high is too high of a risk? We found uh, in our search BNP concentrations greater than 400 and NT pro BNP concentrations greater than 900 um, were associated with higher event rates than trials that had lower thresholds for enrollment. We found only one trial that had an upper limit cutoff for NT pro BNP of 30,000 and we had talked briefly um, before about whether or not high BN NT pro BNP concentrations can allude to something else, such as amyloidosis or infiltrative cardiomyopathies. We also mentioned in our manuscript consideration of multi-marker panels, including IGFBP7, ST2, galactin, high sensitivity troponin to better define uh, enrollment for a specific patient population. Here, and I think this is the most important table, we give recommendations for special circumstances and special populations. So patients with atrial fibrillation and older patients have higher uh, NT pro BNP and BNP concentrations in the absence of heart failure. So we recommend increasing enrollment threshold for these patients by 20 to 30 percent. Um, Conversely, black patients and obese patients have lower NT pro BNP and BNP concentrations than expected and we recommend consideration of lowering enrollment threshold by 20 to 30 percent. And I think this becomes really important, especially in black patients who have historically been underrepresented in clinical trials. So this may be one way to improve enrollment um, in addition to several other factors that um, need to be completed to improve enrollment. With nephrolysin inhibition, um, we published a paper in JAK. Um, we measured different BNP assays after patients were started on Secubitril Valsartan, and we saw that the response varied depending on the assay used. So for BNP, we believe that more data is needed given the variability in response, but that it should be continued um, to be used for risk enrichment, uh, but cautioned when assessing initial response since we mentioned um, Dr. Solomon mentioned that initial increase in BNP concentrations um, when patients are first started on neprilysin inhibitors. We have several limitations. Uh, we relied on data reported on clinicaltrials.gov, and several trials did not report their outcomes. Definitions of HEFREF and HEFPEF varied, and the search in this database did not allow for use of high-level statistics, so our recommendations are based on prior clinical trial data, and we made adjustments based on clinical expertise. So in conclusion, the BNP and NT pro BNP are used as inclusion criteria in several um, heart failure clinical trials. Despite the widespread use, cutoffs used vary widely, and we call for standardization of natriuretic peptide inclusion criteria across trials. Thank you. Great presentation, Nazarene. Thank you. And uh, I'll ask your senior mentor, Dr. Januzzi, to comment on uh, these recommendations. It's you have to have a roadmap to enroll patients in clinical trials with uh, all the yeses and nos and ups and downs. Well, I, you know, I think one of the things that we have learned right from the beginning of the biomarker era is that oversimplifying things uh, leads to more problems than benefits. So you know, if one can integrate physiology together, I think the answer will be, um, you know, a, a little more fruitful. So, for example, as, as Dr. Ibrahim mentioned, and as was alluded to in the prior talk, you know, taking higher cutoffs for those patients with atrial fibrillation will help you to find the sweet spot 
finding patients at risk, that, you know, which is really what you're looking for in most cases when you use inclusion criteria. Um, so, so I think that, that, you know, with some considerations here, Chris, um, which, which I would argue are worthwhile, we can improve the accuracy of what we're trying to achieve by using these inclusion thresholds. The challenge, of course, and this gets to a question that Dr. Greenberg asked, um, you know, are we running the risk of making it impossible to enroll patients if we ratchet the inclusion cutoff too high, for example, with heart failure with preserved DF, which is associated with lower values? And that's always a challenge uh, to sort of balance, you know, making sure you get the right patients with, um, you know, getting enough patients to complete your trial. Well, the beauty of the group is that we've got uh, uh, the commander investigators uh, on the call, and uh, Barry was uh, co-PI of Commander HF, and they made an adjustment in the middle of their trial to have a stricter uh, um, or to have a uh, uh, an NT Pro cutoff. Barry, would you like to comment on that, and did that uh, help the trial? And I think Dr. Cunningham was, uh, was involved in that analysis too. Dr. Greenberg on? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, it, it ended up being very helpful, and that was initiated because of uh, the observation of the data as it was coming in showing a lower than expected event rate. And there were concerns that although patients had met the other entry criteria into the trial, we were getting a very low risk population so that the likelihood of being able to detect a treatment effect was going to be compromised by that. Uh, with the addition of the uh, BNP entry criteria, uh, the risk profile did change uh, substantially. Unfortunately, the trial was still uh, negative. But I think it did have a uh, substantial impact on the uh, type of patient that was recruited. Did it? Did the uh, the use of that act slow enrollment rates? No, not at all. Okay, Dr. Sopka, what are well, you're nodding your head? What do, What do you think of the proposed uh, guidance and? Uh, if you want to comment on the HEFPEF trial, uh, please do. Sure. Everyone might want to mute. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, I think that the guidance is quite nice. And what I would think is that each of these guidances would have to be individualized for the trial based on the population. Um, I think that what this does is provide a nice uh, framework for uh, people thinking about starting clinical trials, perhaps many of these single site clinical trials to, to really have some guidance on how to put these together um, without um, necessarily pre-specifying exactly what those cutoffs should be, because I do think that is going to be dependent on uh, other characteristics of the population, perhaps how you're, being, how you're measuring the values. We have a question from one of our colleagues uh, who are on the call, and this will be directed to Dr. Cunningham. Uh, do we think Paragon trial invalidates Walter Paulus's uh, cyclic GMP deficiency hypothesis on path pathophysiology, or is it because Entresto could not increase natriuretic peptides sufficiently for cyclic GMP increase in the heart? Oh, well, uh, that question. Hopefully, it's not a uh, it's it's not a just a multiple choice answer between those two. You know, I, I wouldn't say that the, the Paragon results invalidate the the Walter Pollitt uh, hypothesis. Uh, you know, it's not not a detailed mechanistic study. Um, we do know across multiple trials that the Cuba 12 Sartan raises urinary cyclic GMP across the um, you know the suite of of trials with this drug. And so I don't think it's a failure to raise um, cyclic GMP uh, signaling that was the uh, that was observed in this trial, but I also don't think uh, we can say that it totally invalidates that that hypothesis. Chris, if I can add to that, I mean I think you know again um, 
we don't know that the rise in cyclic GMP uh, that is caused by this drug is responsible for the benefit, even in paradigm. And in fact, um, th that is really just a marker of target engagement. Um, it, it's what happens when you um, you tickle the natriuretic peptide receptors downstream uh, or upstream. And um, we, you know, I, I, I don't think that we can say anything really about um, uh, about the hypothesis based on um, these data one way or the other. Uh, let me uh, challenge Maria Rosa to comment on Paragon HF. Obviously, uh, there was a, a differential signal by uh, sex, and uh, there was differential um, maybe signal by ejection fraction, and obviously Scott and his team have uh, reported on this. Should we live uh, by a nominal p-value of 06, or should we be more continuous uh, and Bayesian in our thinking of whether this um, therapy is effective in HEPFEP? So, um, can you hear me? Yes. So, actually, as uh, Jonathan was presenting the data, I was reflecting on the fact that nt BMP predicted the events, and it was decreased um, more in the sacubitril valsartan group than in the uh, valsartan alone group. So I can't help it but think um, about whether a larger sample size would have led to um, uh, statistical significance and um, one comment I wanted to make both about Paragon and um, the um, consensus paper is that I really uh, like the idea of adjusting the levels according to BMI because as an investigator in Paragon I had patients that met all criteria for having half path, but their BMI was just such that their anti pro BMP was not compatible with their their enrollment. I mean, they met the echocardiographic criteria. I even had um, uh, right heart cath um, data, and yet they didn't meet it because there was no adjustment in the anti pro BMP level. So I. I'm especially happy about that recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Abraham, you have a question. Well, I have a comment. And, uh, you know, it, it's a good segue for Maria Rosa's comment uh, because she knows well that in some device trials, uh, we have been using a BMI corrected uh, BNP or NT pro BNP uh, cutoff for inclusion. And rather than a single sort of correction, uh, at ABMI, you know, we've relied on a couple of papers that suggest that there is a, you know, reasonably predictable approximate 4% reduction in the BNP level or, or NT pro BNP level measured for every one BMI unit over a BMI of 20. Uh, in the COAP trial, we used that, uh, and it turned out that patients who uh, met the inclusion criteria for enrollment based on BMI adjusted BNP had the exact same risk of a future event, morbidity and mortality, as those patients who got in by virtue of having had a heart failure hospitalization in the past 12 months. Maria and I are working on another trial now that's using this same uh, BMI correction formula for inclusion. So I think the point's really well taken, and it does uh, allow patients who otherwise get excluded uh, because of uh, low BNPs, uh, uh, because of obesity into the trial, and they've got high risk. Great comments, uh, Bill. I'm going to ask uh, Joe Rogers to make a comment about the contamination of HEFPEF trials with uh, amyloid patients um, and how that could influence results. I think uh, one hypothesis that the investigators have made in Paragon is that uh, uh, the attenuated response in men may be that there was some admixture of amyloid patients. Should we should we have an upper limit of NT-PRO cutoff that may uh, limit 
amyloid patients in HEPTEF trials. So first, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so I think it's, the question you're asking is a, a really provocative one, and I think it's been a challenge for most of, the, or many of the HEPTEF trials that have been done, and that's the, the variability in the phenotype. Um, which, which probably is having an influence on uh, not only how we enroll people in those studies, but also in the outcome. And so, so I think uh, being very thoughtful about using um, natriuretic peptides as a, um, an inclusion criteria um, may help us separate out some of those different etiologies and get you a more pure um, phenotype that you're actually studying. I'd like to just take an opportunity to ask another question, though, of the clinical trialists who are um, on the panel, and that is, I wanted to just take the question that you asked at the beginning a little farther, and that is, um, you know, if, if you looked at that table, you've got um, a variety of different um, baseline characteristics that make BNP and N NT pro levels go up and down. How many corrections do you make? Because that patient population is going to have multiple comorbidities. And how do you use all of those different um, comorbidities to really try to get a more narrowed down patient population? I can take that one on, Chris, if you'd like. Yes, Jim. Uh, and, and this will be our sort of final comments before we transition into the next uh, section. Yeah, thanks. So, so Joe, it's a really important question because there's so many different competing physiologies. And in the uh, editorial that we wrote um, uh, next to the Paragon paper, um, uh, Peter Meyer and I, you know, sort of spoke to the fact that in HEFPEF, particularly with all of the different comorbidities, it's almost like shooting arrows into the wind. You've got, you know, wind pushing it up, wind pushing it down. And so, you know, to hit the target may be challenging for that reason. I would say that this is an ideal circumstance for large data sets to be analyzed using machine learning to, to examine how the different physiologies um, push up, push down, which ones matter most to really ultimately come to the answer that you're looking for. But there is no simple answer at present. Well, this has been a terrific discussion on, uh, I didn't think one could actually talk, talk for 45 minutes on natriuretic peptides with uh, so much enthusiasm and smiles. And I know this is a short duration for you, Dr. Januzzi. You, uh, <laughs> you, you'd speak to 24 hours on this and, uh, and then start the clock over. 